and, and it's just like, it's just horror, terror. Because that, that's really, it's a really frightening thing to witness. That they, you can, or they can tell you that they're, that they're scared. Um, and then, if they can help. And then the pruritus, that you don't usually have the itching unless you have the rash. So, and then you can sometimes have a metallic taste in your mouth. Um, itchy eyes, sneezing, clear, watery eye discharge, all that. The urticaria hives, angioedema, the facial, and the skin. So y'all really do have some, some um, pictures in your way to talk to you about that. Good page. All right. So this was a, like a general reaction. The mild. So this is um, is moderate. It's um, dizzy, weak, you have nausea, and vomiting, um, and that you know, that is a surprise to some people. Like uh, Isabel said, she had that with some of her reaction, and diarrhea can happen. Abdominal pain, fecal urgency, or incontinence. You can have that um, really bad. Those things are, you wouldn't think that that was an allergic reaction, but, but it is more, more of a systemic kind of, kind of thing. Um, and then you can, you can have that, that um, back pain. And um, the chemo drugs and targeted therapies and stuff like that, we talked about that a little bit while ago. But um, you can have, you can give some of those targeted therapies for like RA and Crohn's disease and, and, um, um, okay. What's that? Hmm? So, no, no, I can't, I can't think of the, the guy, the, the golfer, who he has oh. it. Psoriatic. Psoriatic arthritis. Yeah. Have you heard of that? He's, he advertises it. Humira that he has, yeah. or which one is it? Yeah. Whatever. Humira. Anyway, he, so, anyway, the um, IgG infusions, you can have to cause that kind of, kind of problem also. So that would be kind of a moderate reaction if you're not having any pain coming, any problem with your breathing. Okay, so then severe, if you can faint, you can have a seizure. Um, and then uh, the respiratory step, of course, if you've got the angioedema of the airway that closes and shuts, you've got coarseness of the lungs and the lung and throat where you can tell that it's closing up. Attacks that you know, wheezing, you know, really bad wheezing, you could hear it from the door of the room or walking by or whatever. That, that's pretty severe, isn't it? But what's even worse than bad wheezing? No, no, no wheezing. Yes, no wheezing. Y'all, I'm sure y'all got to that in your respiratory unit. It, that's always emphasized in every book, I guess. Um, and then the cardiovascular. Um, your blood pressure is going to drop, and you can have an arrhythmia or the tachycardia. That, that's um, that's kind of what my dad did. That, that, that septic, it's sort of like a septic thing, but this isn't this isn't the same thing. Um, it is it is um, threatening your um, your circulation and also the, the, the um, blood pressure drops and um, the tachycardia. And, the, and you can also um, sometimes see like differences in the, the top number and the bottom number. And that really drop, drop down a little bit. But anyway, hypotension, you know, the blood pressure increasing in the arrhythmias. So, um, there is a little, Thank <laughs> you. 
was uh, collapsed and unconscious on my kitchen floor, uh, having turned uh, uh, a shade of blue. John's episode was likely triggered by peanuts. He's been allergic since childhood, but symptoms had always been mild. Nausea, hives, and flushing. Those who've had a mild allergic reaction to a food substance or an insect sting at one point can have an anaphylactic reaction unpredictably in the future. Dr. Wyatt Decker says anaphylaxis happens when your immune system identifies a substance such as peanuts as foreign. This triggers cells called mast cells to release chemicals that cause many symptoms, including dilated blood vessels, low blood pressure, flushing, constricted airways, intestinal problems, and even death. But an injection of epinephrine from an auto-injector can reverse symptoms and save your life. Pull off the cap, you pull it to your thigh, and you inject it, and then you hold it in there for 10 seconds. Dr. Ronna Campbell and Dr. Decker have teamed up with other health organizations to teach people about anaphylaxis. It's called the Be Safe Campaign. S means seek support. Call 911. A stands for allergen. Try to identify what caused your reaction. F is for follow-up, see your doctor afterwards, and E is for epinephrine, the medication John carries with him in case a severe reaction happens again. Dr. Decker says if you have an anaphylactic reaction, it is vitally important to seek emergency medical care. That's because sometimes symptoms can get worse or even recur within 24 to 48 hours. It's also important to talk to your doctor after an allergic reaction to see if you should be carrying an epinephrine auto-injector. The team of experts spearheading this campaign includes members of the American College of Emergency Physicians and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The Food and Allergy and Anaphylactic Network is a great source for interested patients or family members. For Medical Edge, I'm Vivian Williams. is unpredictable. It could be mild one minute, then suddenly it's scary. Like, you can't even breathe scary. For your skin, it's all itchy and breaks out into hives scary. 
or your throat starts to tickle and close scary. It's different for everybody. Every reaction is different. A mild reaction one time can be life-threatening the next. So it's important to know your body, and know when it starts to feel funny. It could be the warning signs of anaphylaxis. So it's also important to know how to use one of these. An EpiPen auto-injector. EpiPen and EpiPen Junior are for the emergency treatment of life-threatening allergic reactions. And for people who are at an increased risk for these reactions. EpiPen and EpiPen Junior should only be used to help someone during an emergency. Ready to show them how it's done? Yeah! EpiPen Junior, the one with the green label, is for kids. Like me! And EpiPen, the yellow label, for bigger people. Like me. Whether you need to use EpiPen on yourself or give it to someone else, you can just follow these simple steps. So first things first. You take it out of the tube. Just flip open the yellow cap. Or the green cap. Slide it out. And hold it like this. Move it to the sky. Orange to the thigh. Then take off the blue cap. Blue safety release. Never put your hands near the orange tip because that's where the needle comes out. The needle is designed to go through clothing, including jeans, because it must be injected into the outer thigh for quick absorption. If you're helping a young child, like me, hold the leg firmly in place. Once it is, you just do this. Boom. It clicks, so you know it worked. Then you hold it there for three seconds. Then, remove EpiPen. You'll still see some liquid in there. But don't worry, your EpiPen Junior Auto Injector gave you the right dose. And it has a special feature, the Never See Needle. Yeah, so the needle's totally covered up. So you should never see the needle. Then rub the spot for 10 seconds while you or someone else gets emergency medical help right away. Call us an ambulance. <laughs> or have someone take you to the emergency room. Just make sure to do it immediately. And you should always carry two EpiPen auto injectors wherever you go. They even come put together because some people might need the second dose. Take your expired or used EpiPen auto injectors to your doctor's office and ask for a refill. Remember, epinephrine is the only first line treatment for anaphylaxis, not antihistamines. So just trust yourself and do it. Don't hesitate, especially if you know the symptoms of a life threatening allergic reaction. And I've practiced with the great trainer that comes in the box. Now, this is what's important to people like me. And me. Use EpiPen Epinephrine Injection USP 0.3 mg or EpiPen Junior Epinephrine Injection USP 0.15 mg auto injectors right away when you have an allergic emergency, anaphylaxis. Get emergency medical help right away. You may need further medical attention. Only a healthcare professional should give additional doses of epinephrine if you need more than two injections for a single anaphylactic episode. EpiPen or EpiPen Junior should only be injected into the middle of your outer thigh, upper leg, through clothing if necessary. Do not inject into your veins, buttocks, fingers, toes, hands, or feet. Hold the leg of young children firmly in place before and during injection to prevent injuries. In case of accidental injection, please seek immediate medical treatment. Rarely, patients who have used EpiPen or EpiPen Junior may develop an infection at the injection site within a few days. Some of these infections can be serious. Call your healthcare professional right away if you have any of the following at an injection site. Redness that does not go away, swelling, tenderness, or the area feels warm to the touch. Tell your healthcare professional about all of your medical conditions, especially if you have asthma, a history of depression, thyroid problems, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, high blood pressure or heart problems, have any other medical <coughs> conditions, are pregnant or plan to become pregnant, or are breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed. Be sure to also tell your healthcare professional all the medicines you take, especially medicines for asthma. If you have certain medical conditions or take certain medicines, your condition may get worse or you may have longer lasting side effects when you use EpiPen or EpiPen Junior. Common side effects include fast, irregular, or pounding heartbeat, sweating, nausea or vomiting, breathing problems, paleness, dizziness, weakness, shakiness, headache, feelings of overexcitement, nervousness, or anxiety. These side effects usually go away quickly if you lie down and rest. Tell your healthcare professional if you have any side effect that bothers you or that does not go away. Visit EpiPen.com for full prescribing information and patient information. EpiPen and EpiPen Junior Auto Injectors are for the emergency treatment of life-threatening allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, caused by allergens, exercise, or unknown triggers, and for people who are at increased risk for these reactions. EpiPen and EpiPen Junior are intended for immediate administration as emergency supportive therapy only. Seek immediate emergency medical help right away. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Visit www.fda.gov medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. 
For additional information, please contact us at 800-395-3376. Talk to your healthcare professional to see if EpiPen or EpiPen Junior Auto Injectors are right for you. actually practice on yourself it tells you how to reset it it, it gives you the the directions on here and so, so Will be like 0.3 to 0.5 mLs of a 1 to 1,000 epinephrine dose. 
And then um, if you've got a history of allergy to insect venom or food allergies and um, these things and any of that kind of stuff, you need to be really clear in And the best for you is to stabilize the airway for sure. And I think I missed one of our comments that's up here about. Um, if you, did you hear that on that one video when the, the guy says, if you have, are treating anaphylaxis, the only thing that, that, you, that, will, that you want to do at first anyway, as far as, if you don't want to give antihistamines if you're anaphylaxis, do you? If, you, if it's true anaphylaxis and the blood pressure's dropping and they keep breathing all, all that kind of stuff, um, we, we, have to, we have to give the epinephrine. So that's the... That's the main thing. So epinephrine is our main drug to to take care of this. Well, anyway, just know that the that the the epinephrine is the main drug that's going to kill it. Anaphylaxis doesn't mean that people get hurt. It definitely is the the preferred drug to reverse the hand. So, okay, um, we're going to have to do our airway management. You might have to have endotracheal tube in the emergency tracheostomy sometimes. Um, and the plasmapheresis, sometimes if you can't get um, enough reaction, otherwise if it, if it just continues and continues and continues after I've taken the epinephrine, they can put you on plasmapheresis where the blood speaks through um, uh, a cell separator to keep getting out some of those um, anti antibody antigen <coughs> complexes that are they're, um, causing the, the perpetual reaction. And um, then they'll give you the uh, red blood cells returned to the client with the, with albumin and plasma to, to give them volume because the patient's got um, low blood pressure and all. Um, and it's not just one, it's just a video as a series because it, it takes a while to, to get rid of it sometimes. Um, and yeah, sometimes that's with that good pasture syndrome and the glomerulonephritis and stuff. That's just an example for it. And um, Sometimes um, complementary therapies, uh, people with asthma type 1 hypersensitivity, if um, people are using herbals or teas or aromatherapy, and especially like um, chamomile tea, can cause a ragweed like reaction. Does anybody drink chamomile like they sleep at time? <laughs> I love it. I mean, I don't, I don't know that it tastes the best, but it, it, it makes, me, makes me feel chill when I try to. Calm them down, but, but it, it had never bothered me, but that's one thing that if you do have a lot of hay fever when somebody's giving you a history and they say they, they drink a lot of chamomile tea, you can just say, well, you, you might want to just pay attention to that and see if it, it causes any symptoms like the, like the hay fever does. Um, and then we need to, um, to talk to people that are from different cultures and, and uh, the way that they treat from the school because they may be doing something different than and what we're doing, and it might it might be something dangerous or an interaction. There's so many things that interact with like heparin or anticoagulants and things like that. Okay, so urticaria and pruritus flushy. You can give the um, preventative every six hours as needed for the patient. Um, and if they get the hypotension because the vasodilation and the third spacing, it just it makes the the EFS is permeable and so the fluid goes out into the tissues and instead of staying in the vascular space. So you have to use fluid resuscitation with um, saline or, or um, even some of the things with lactate creamers. And you might have to use large volumes. And, or you might even have to use some dopamine. Uh,
anyway, the, there are vasopressors that you can use um, to, to get the blood pressure back up. And you can, um, you're going to use your, your albuterol intubation. And monoclonal is, is another one that can, um, can dilate the, the bronchial tubes. And, and um, you, can, you can give, give that if, if you need that B1 hydrocortisone, five milligrams per kilogram. You don't have to remember all these doses because that, that's going to be different in different places and different weights and pages and all that. That's just, this is just examples. Um, but what we're doing is, is our uh, beta adrenergics and, and uh, our steroids, our antihistamines, and fluids and resuscitation. And um, especially we have our hydrocortisone for our cytokinin health. We used to use solumedrol a whole lot when somebody was starting to have a reaction or to try to prevent a reaction. Sometimes it's not easy with certain medications if it's not resolved in 30 minutes. And these are not going to act real fast, are they? But that's not what you want to do first, necessarily. Sometimes if you've got a whole big staff of people, yeah, you can do things at one time if you've got access, if you've got access to, to put different things in at one time. But, but, um, Steroids would, would um, normally come, come later to, to maybe extend the, the, um, the therapy as far as, as um, keeping it from uh, rearing up again. Okay, and then that um, it's a newer drug, Zolair, X O L A I R, and it, it does inhibit the type 1 that has to do with the, the IgE, the free floating IgE, and prevents it from binding to. That's a really, that's kind of a breakthrough, but I understand it's really, really, really expensive. But, you know, that's what's the life worth, though. But um, you have to have the uh, RAS testing and approval from a physician and insurance company and manufacturer and all that kind of thing. But it may, it may take a, up to a year to work, so it's not something that needs to do in an emergency. It's something they want to, to prevent the emergency if somebody has had um, serious reactions. So, our, our nursing process, we're going to look at all, all of these things, the description of the reaction and what, what seemed to elicit that reaction, um, and then have the, the skin testing, um, for the history, we've already we'll talked about all of that. And I do have some just examples of nursing diagnoses. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be, be so particular about, um, about NANDA. I, NANDA's a nice tool, but... Uh, Problems, issues, and concerns are fine too. So, so uh, we don't want to be limiting you to to just NANDA. And, and you know that sometimes it, you, you don't have something that describes it exactly like what your patient has. So, so um, I, I'm certainly fine with that. You might talk to your your uh, clinical instructor, and make sure that they're fine with it. But that's what they keep telling us in all these national meetings. We can't we can't just do it. We need to expand. So. I'm trying to open up my vocabulary. Okay. All right. Ineffective airway clearance. And that could certainly be a, an issue. And mainly, what's blocking your airway? Edema. Yeah. Sure is. Um, and so, what position we put in, put people in when they can't breathe well? So, yeah, what is that power? It's pretty, pretty high up, and you gotta have be able to be able to expand their um, diaphragm. And um, we're gonna look at their level of consciousness, that go or see level of consciousness. I didn't have to put you in my slide, but right now, um, and anxiety, air hunger, possible obstruction, um, this is the use of oxygen, um, nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airway, so to the diaphragm. Describe all of those things are the Okay, if the patient does go into shock um, after breathing is established and that you've got their, their airways clear uh, enough to get, get oxygen in, um, we, we do need to, to think about the, the positioning because of, of what, so what some people used to do was to do that Trendelenburg position when somebody was, was um, in shock. <coughs> trying to get the airway, you've got to have them elevated in one 
once you got the air well established and there there was uh, blood pressure dropping, then you you uh, used to kind of stand them on the head on their head in the Trendella bird position. But but now they're they're telling us that um, to to increase the, the cardiac output, um, you want to, to have the positioning to where you can maintain the blood pressure without putting pressure on those abdominal organs. But if you got somebody standing on their head, their bowels and everything's going to um, go against the diaphragm. It's going to be going to have to breathe. And um, then it, 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 you're going to have this, this uh, pretty much flat. And if you know, you're getting these people, but it's set. It's at 10, um, 10 degrees elevation, or no more than 10 degrees elevation. But you can have it flat or 10 degrees, because it depends on which source that you look at. But we don't um, really recommend anymore to put them on, on the head with the <coughs> bird. You may still see that sometimes. If, if that's if nothing else works, you do what you need to do. But, but um, that, that's, uh, that's what they're recommending now, to, um, to have the head down below below the heart, if, or, or if you have the, the head down below the heart, then that, that um, really does compromise the, the other blood connections. So um, what we can do for the decreased cardiac output is go and um, look at the level of consciousness, because that tells about the perfusion to the brain, that you know, stuff to have oxygen to the brain, monitor our vitals, um, and then we, we need to have a large bore IV catheter, probably multiple ones. If there's an emergency situation, that's going to, you're not likely to have a pick line of them just coming in to the emergency area. Um, and you're going to insert a new catheter and monitor the urine output. And, and uh, if there's like um, venom of some, some sort, you, you can put a tourniquet above the site of the, the venom. But you have to watch that to make sure you're not cutting off all of the perfusion to that limb. Um, Okay. And you want to stay with them. That's a, that's a big thing is they're totally, they're, they're really, really terrified if they're conscious. Okay, so risk for injury related to transfusion. We need to ask about previous transfusions if they have reactions. Um, check for informed consent for blood products if the transfusion is disordered. Um, and use two licensed healthcare professionals to check the client with a low tide water check or cross match with expiration dates. But when, when I was teaching about um, in, in the PU class, their their book was talking about um, that there there are um, facilities that that let this one one arm in check it with a, with a barcode type of thing. Did you notice that before? Did they do that? Are you at one of these? Or? Oh, yeah, no, I realize that they do it for the just the So, you don't have the I know I've had students that have that were working with transfusions, but I wasn't in, in the room with them when they, when they did that. But anyway, you want to do a, um, a baseline vital sign check. Before you initially come get you on board the transfusion, and you're going to uh, record the vital signs. Um, uh, well, it, it depends on what your institution says, but it's usually about every 15 minutes for several several times. And um, and then you, you can um, sometimes see that if, if the patient has had any any potential for or um, having a reaction or has reacted to antibiotics or something like that, they may go ahead and, and um, pre-medicate with acetaminophen and diphenhydramine before the transfusion. And they often they do that PO, and uh, they do it at least like half an hour before. And then you want to continue to look at the separate infusion site from any other um, uh, medications or, or IVs that you're, you're putting in. And uh, most of the people usually use a 20 gauge um, IV for infusion, but one of the nurses that was on our floor on ATA said that 22 is a pain most of the time. So, uh, you know, we, we thought that it would really penalize the sales. But, but sometimes they say if, they're, if somebody's had low blood pressure in there, they're going to use more like fluid resuscitation and, and it's going to, needs to go fast or whatever. They, and, and in emergency rooms and stuff like that, they usually do put. 18s, um, you know, it's 
instead of instead of 20s or 22s even. But but yeah, I heard the other day they they still can use the, the 22s. So that's fine. But things change, and we have. going to administer the blood. We're going to start not normal saline before we start the thing from the IV. And then about um, 50 ml of blood during the first 15 minutes. It kind of depends again on the institution. That's, a, that's an example. Um, and then the, the monitor for the back of chest pain. Um, any temperature increase over 1.8. Again, that may vary from institution to institution. Um, and if they got chills or, or increased um, pulse rate or if they were breathing um, more rapidly, uh, wheezing, hypotension, hives, rashes, cyanosis. So if um, if there is a, any of that happening, even including that the temperature increase, um, what, what would we do? So yeah, you got to you gotta cut it off, don't you? And and then 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 you're gonna do what are you going to do with the saline? Because they, you, you have those kind of piggyback together um, on the in the blood sets. So what do you do? What do you do with the with the saline? Yeah, yeah you change the tubing. Absolutely. And where where do you change the tubing from? From the bag to the, to the IV. All the way to the hub. Yeah, because because if you do, if you start put if if you've got it got blood in the um, um, oh God, what do you call it? The, the little set, extension set, the little extension set that's right in the hub. Um, if there's blood in that, and then, then the next units is up above that, you've just got to take everything, all of that blood out, because if you start that saline, there's a little bit of blood in there, you don't want to give, give them any more. So you have to you have to change all of that tubing and, and um, um, Make sure that they're not getting any more of that blood in there because that may, they make them even worse. So yeah, that's that's the deal. No matter how mild it is, you, you've got to you've got to take care of that. And then once you you get them um, hooked up with the saline, certainly with the, the healthcare provider, but then you'll, you'll eventually send the blood administration set to the lab, um, and then fresh blood and urine samples they'll they'll do to see what's going on. And if there's not any adverse reactions, they usually administer blood over about two to four hours. But the time frames are important because over four hours they consider it as a virus because because the bacteria can start growing even longer than it pays because it's supposed to be cool. I mean it's a protein that you know you don't leave your milk out of the refrigerator for four hours. So um, you know you, you want to make sure that you're not going to Okay, and that's a real important page, though. That those are some real important things to to tend to, especially about the change of the tubing and all that. Because it can, and uh, you don't want to actually take the, the IV out because it may be hard to, to get another access, and you, you need to have that access for really sure. Okay. So community-based care, teaching vital components of care. Access kit. That's that's one of the very, 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 very most important things is to is to teach the patient to to use the access kit. It is it, it really does make sense to avoid the allergen, you know, if, if you can. But there's no guarantee that the allergen might just find you. And and so and there's there's just like the somebody that got had touched the, the counter and it had been there's been some peanut some something penal on the on the counter and he, he touched it and then ate some stands and bam it was he was on the floor. And um, and that, that can happen with bee stings and stuff like that. You don't mean to encounter a bee, but sometimes you sometimes you're gonna kinda encounter those if you can see outside at all. So so yes, avoid it. That that is that's the, the most well, that's the easiest thing to try to do, but that's not really hundred percent. You've got to know 
what to do if you do become a friend. So the very number one thing, just like that guy on the video said, is that you've got to get that, that epinephrine. You've just got to. The epinephrine is the, the number one consideration when, when somebody's having a reaction, especially like, like these things, like a, if you're if somebody's at school or at work and they're back in the morning, it's a little temper. Her empty can, we can, and she couldn't handle it. We, we know she's got it now, so we can, we can go scrounge around and find that baby and take care of her then. But, um, but that's going to be the very number one uh, issue. And the one thing that it causes more deaths in the anaphylaxis is failure to get epinephrine into people quick enough. That's, that's something fairly, fairly new um, that I have read. It may have been in my opinion, all state division for a I have not really read it exactly like that before, but that's what they say, the epinephrine, you've got to get that epinephrine into people and, and don't don't hesitate if you if there's any feeling that there's a reaction going on with somebody that's got a history of it and has the epi pen, um, that you, you want to make sure that you, you get that epinephrine in because people, people die when you don't because they, they just you can't breathe and they don't get any perfusion. So anyway, just remember that. That's the that's the new the new kind of motto here with our with our unity. Okay. Oh, and it is really uh, so talking about the transfusions again. Um, we need to at least mention to people if they have blood reactions before blood transfusion reactions before. Um, or if, they, if they're afraid that they might have a reaction, then you can, you can have your own blood um, stored. And then if you're planning on having an elective surgery where they, they uh, help you to have some units that, that um, match your, your blood type and everything, if you have your own blood banked um, at, the, at your hospital, then, um, then that's, a, that's a potential um, option. It's so sad, though, that most people that have blood transfusions can't bank their own blood because they don't even make it enough, or they, they're, they're behind already, and so they're, it's, or it's an emergency situation, and they're bleeding out or something like that. So, so it's not it's not something that you can always have, but, but, um, but some, people, some people just do it anyway. You don't know how long it's for it, but you, if, if they think that they're going to have some sort of like a surgery. Um, we want to try to prevent the immune complex reaction with the um, with our, uh, with our care, and we definitely want to prevent the, the contact dermatitis. And we want to expose our skin to air and sun as much as possible. That's what this says. But we still we're going to be doing skin cancer soon, so I'm going to be saying that. But, but um, Dr. McGree is the one that I've uh, sent around some. I think you can see he's the he's the for a young, young doctor, he, um, he's, he really is an advocate of having 15 to 20 minutes of sunlight exposure, um, unprotected sunlight exposure every day. And uh, I guess if you have, um, if you are wearing sunscreen and you're and you're out, out in it, then that's you still get a percentage of, of, of the sun. Um, but that is, a, but it's a really a real asset. So for our vitamin D. Um, we want to avoid contact with people with infections, and we want to use that natural fiber um, clothing if we're susceptible to problems with um, the other conditions like that. And um, we want to avoid the extremes of, of heat, heat and cold um, if we can help it. Uh, there, is, there is a um, cold resolution. Does anybody, is anybody familiar with that? When, when you go out in the cold, there's, a, there's some sort of I don't remember which is the IG, which IG is that what it's called? That has a, there is a cold or gluten though. And some people when they get cold, think they don't have, if their, their arms are not covered and, they, and it gets cold when they're going on a walk or something like that, they're not really prepared and, and, um, and it, they can just turn really, really red or have, um, have a rash or hives to, to come up. And then it, then it just goes away once you get warmed up. But has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, it doesn't always go away. What's that? It doesn't always go away. Well, I mean, like the hives go away and stuff, but you, you have, like, a, that, they just have that for life. Right? I mean, it depends on what you're getting exposure to the cold or the heat or whatever. But, but I guess that's.
that's why they were mentioning that. To, if, if that's the, the problem, that's why we're going to do it. I think that's why it's written like that. Okay. I'm going to cut you through already. Um,